continually throughout the day. And when we think about praise to bless the Lord, you know, synonyms to bless the Lord, exalt him, to magnify, to thank him. You know, I, I understand how important it is to, to, to spend that time going to the Lord and, and asking for this and asking to move in these situations. But I think it's just that high point when you can go and just thank him every day. Just say, you know, Lord, today, at this, this moment in time, I'm not going to come and ask you for anything. I'm just going to come and thank you. I'm just going to come and bless you. I'm just going to come and praise you. I, I know we, we often uh, sing that song, you know, when we, when we talk about come let us adore him. We tend to, that, that tend to just kind of be encapsulated around Christmas time. But it should be all year long. Come let us adore him. Thank God for what he's done for you this week, this moment, what he will do for you in the future, what he's already done. I think that's where people get off in, in their relationship with God because they, they, they go through a hard moment in their life and they seem to forget what God had done for them in the past. If God delivered you, and I, I know sometimes I say the same thing because God's still the same, but if God delivered me from A, what makes me think he won't deliver me from B? What makes him think he won't come through again? Because he will. I will bless the Lord at all times. That's what the Bible says. All times his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now, if praise is continually in my mouth, why do we let anything else get in our mouth? You know? Some old doubt. And, and that that's the thing that... that we, we, we need to know who to listen to, and who to listen to is God, and not listen to doubt. And that's what we have. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know if I'm going to make it. Well, we got a God that says, you will make it, because he's the one who made it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Psalms 44, 8 says, we will praise God all day long. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Oh, and to your name, we will give thanks forever. Hallelujah. I love that. And, and I love listening to Christian music. And Philip Sandifer is one of my favorite artists. And I remember one night, this, this song came up. And, 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 you know, sometimes God just speaks to you. If somebody has a Christian song. And sometimes it'll be in the midst of all the turmoil and things going around. And then that peaceful voice comes up to you. And one day, this, this happened years ago when I was out there in my semi, and this song came on, and it's, and it, and it's just because you are, <coughs> Philip Sanders, just because you are. I love that. Just God, just because you are God. That's it. And I want to read just a little bit of the, the lyrics of it. Father of the world, you are the life within me. God of all creation, living in my heart. I will praise you, Lord, mm -hmm. regardless of your blessing, for you are worthy of my praise, Lord, just because you are. Yeah. Hallelujah. Is that powerful? Is that powerful? Hallelujah. 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 Just a few more. Just because you are forever, I will praise you. Just because you are, I will glorify your name. Just because you are, I love this next one, got digging deep. I lay my life before you. Uh -huh. Father, I adore you just because you are. Folded in your arms, I've never been without you. Hallelujah. Through, through every tear I've ever cried, I've always found you there. But cradled in your love, it's easy, Lord, to praise you. But even when the times get hard and it seems I'm alone, still I'll always praise you, Father, just because you are. Hallelujah. 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 And we want to never forget that this morning. When we go to praise God, you know, to come. Because I remember when I was little, it wasn't, it wasn't where do you go to church at? It was where do you go to worship at? I remember that. Where do you worship at? When you take time out of your life to go and meet with people. It's so important to come to church. 
if you can possibly make it, because those testimonies, we always have testimony. That's one thing that drew us here. We love the testimony, because you can say what God has done for, for somebody, because somebody else might be going through something similar. You know, some people, they're, they're kind of quiet in church. They may not say something. And then somebody says, hey, I'm going through that same thing. Wait, wait, God delivered them. I know he can deliver me because he's not a respecter of persons. That's what the Bible says. So as we go to prayers this morning, remember Psalms 121, look toward the hills for which comes my help. He wants us to look up. That's what God wants us to do, look up. It's not the hills. It's the God created the hills that we can look up and praise God. That's what we need to keep our focus. Hallelujah. Our focus always needs to be on God. <clears throat> and, and as we start this uh, uh, praise session off and testimony session off, I ask you to pray uh, with uh, it's my former wife. Her name was Lavola, and we have four sons. And uh, she got rushed to the hospital this week. And um, uh, she's still in the hospital. Um, uh, she's got bleeding on the brain. I mean, it's really serious. They had to life flight her from Keokuk up to Iowa City. And she's still in Iowa City. And I think it's really, it was touching to me. I, I was going to work. I work one to nine this week, and, I, and, and I'm going to work. And all of a sudden, the message comes on my phone. And it's from a third oldest, and he's just, just pray for mom. Just pray for mom. And, and, you know, and I'm glad that he knows I'm a praying person, that he called me up. That he knew I was going to pray. And ever since this, yeah, we're going to pray and find out. They thought she had an aneurysm and, and uh, just it was a, not a good situation. She's, she's uh, still in critical care over at Iowa City. Continue to pray for her. And we, we've got people praying. But, you know, God is more than able. That's right. God is more than able. That's the one thing. The, the boys, they're taking it hard, especially my oldest. He's been in the hospital, too, so he hasn't been able to go up there and see his mom. So it's a, it's a tough situation, but the one thing, even in those tough situations, God is still God, and God is able to touch her life, you know, and, and I'm telling you, there's some things that happen when you're in a hospital room. You can't go anywhere, okay? You're hooked up, and you have time, and you have time to reflect in your life, because I remember when, when I had I, I, an issue with my leg, and I remember uh, when, when they, did, they did back surgery on me. And then when I came out of the room, you know, you check and make sure all your parts are still there. Uh -huh. <laughs> that they didn't cut off the wrong leg or something, you know. <laughs> that they made a mistake. So I'm, I'm coming out, and the, and the guy's willing me up. And, and my, my, my right leg, what happened was that from my knee down, I couldn't move. So I couldn't move my leg, couldn't move my toes. I'm thinking, man, this is not good. So I'm, I'm trying so hard. And my toes are not moving. I'm thinking, man, something's not right. So I went back up to the room, and you, and you got time to think. And then the, 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 one of the doctors come in there, and I told him, he says, well, you know, Tim, that's just the way it is. When we, when we had to go in your spinal cord, they had to do back surgery on my disc, take a disc out. I said, you got to face it. You may never walk again right. You know? You just got to face that. That's just reality. So I said, okay, okay, I, I can, I, I'll deal with that. So I'm sitting there watching this clock in the room, schoolroom clock, and it's just ticking, you know. And I, and I finally said, okay, God, this is it. Yeah. What we're going to do, you gave, you gave me two good arms. I got one good leg. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you, get, you gave me a good mind. You gave me a heart to love me. And if that's the way it's going to be, I'll take that. Mm -hmm. I will take that. I will live with that. Because as long as I had God, we could make it through. Yeah. And so I just kept praying. Then, then the... The nurses came in, and, they, and I was big. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not skinny now, so but I've been a lot bigger. I was 30 pounds away from 500 then, so that's a pretty big man yeah, there. Yeah, so, yeah. so it took five nurses to lift me up, and they and they lifted me up out of the bed, and my, my foot hit the floor. That was the worst pain. I mean, it shot through there. And I said, put me down, put me down. But I knew then that was good yeah. because when the pain started coming through yeah. there, I knew the feeling was coming through yeah. that we was going to be, and we was able to walk out of the hospital. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Just be, hallelujah. Yeah. The one thing about it, like the old saying she used to say, just because the doctor said it, don't make it so. Right. 
because they always used to tell me the older lady says, have you tried Dr. Jesus? That's what they would say. Let's try Dr. Jesus. The mother's got degrees. They might have more degrees than a thermometer, but let me tell you what. I said, Dr. Jesus knows it all because he's the one that created your body. He's the one that can heal. The same Jesus, hallelujah. The, the woman that wished you a blood and she pushed through the crowd, said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. That's how it starts. That's how it starts when you start believing God. Not just the circumstance when you start believing God. And that's what we're looking at this morning. We're going to believe that she's going to be in the name of the bowl. She's going to be totally healed. That she's going to come out of that hospital. She's going to be praising God. And, and her boy, the four sons, I call them my shining stars. That's what I call them. I call them my shining stars. They're going to see a difference in their mom. That's what they're going to see. But there's going to be a praise God. There's going to be a praise God. Because even in those darkest circumstances, I've seen God, people come out and they start praising God. And all the things we went through, the Bible said, oh, you know, all those things. Uh, Romans 8, 28. You know, when we think about all those things, we think that are so bad. God can cause them to work together for the good. And he can get the glory out of it. Because sometimes it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. You know, I, I remember being so depressed one time about something, and, and, and this, the, the Bible teacher says, Jim, you got to realize, you know, uh, one second after midnight, it's a new day. But I said, man, it's still dark, you know. <laughs> it's still dark. He said, start realizing that there's a change coming. See, just to realize a change. It may be still dark, but there's a change coming. That I'm, I'm 60 years old, and not one time that I got up and wonder if the sun was coming up to that, day, that next day. Not one morning. Not one morning did I ever think about that. The sun won't be up sometime. Right? You know, and, and, and that's what we got to always realize. How powerful God is. We tend to make our problems bigger than God. And that's not the way they are. Okay? God was there long before all this started. For the foundations of the world. You know, the answer was always before the foundation of the world. It's not like sometimes we tend to think that, that, that God is surprised what's going on with us. How in the world is that going to happen? You know, in the beginning, God. Somebody asked me, said, in the beginning, God, how far does that back, back does that go? I don't know how far back does the beginning go. It keeps going and going and going. I don't know. But God was there then. Before he was in your mom's belly, he already knew you. So don't you think he's got a solution for you already? And that's why we got to look at it this morning. Come on. Hallelujah. All right. <laughs> we get started. Get started. Get, get, your, get your motor running, buddy. We're ready to get your motor running. We got to work up. Like the old truckers say, put the hammer down. We're going. We're going. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, but do, do remember her name is Lavola. She's over in Iowa City. Just remember, she. I did get a message that she's going to be there at least another week. That's what they're saying. They going to have to, they did one, uh, they went in there once on her brain. They couldn't find exactly what they was looking for. And then they're going to do another operation this week. So I did get a, a message that she's going to be in at least another week. So please pray for her. Yeah. She's in intensive care. Okay, another praise or prayer, uh, prayer request. Yes, Mike. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Oh, yeah. Yes, Cindy. Praise. Yes, Cindy. We're praying for you. We're praying for you. We're praying for you. That's right. Hallelujah. That's what it's about. It's a new day. It's a new day. That's right. His mercy is new every day. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Roberto. Hallelujah.
Definitely pray. Yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I keep talking to uh, Robert Red, and uh, uh, he keeps telling me that uh, his heart is uh, with it, and he's thinking about it, praying about it, and so forth. And uh, uh, he just wants you to want you kindly to know that uh, uh, he's really thinking about it. Praise Amen. the Lord. <coughs> That's awesome. Kids, kids just have such a, a easy way of believing God. They just believe God. Sometimes, sometimes adults can get a lot of things floating around, but kids just they can just believe them. That's why you want to train them that little, so that so they know and just believe God. Can God do anything? Hallelujah, Hallelujah! Don't don't ever forget that. Don't keep keep it with you when you grow up. That my God's able. My God's able. He's a way maker. He said all that when I was a kid. You know. He, he can make a way out of no way. You know, I, I, you, one of the be best illustrations was, was uh, in, in the Old Testament when the Egyptians was coming, <clears throat> they saw the dust and you have the Red Sea. Well, ain't very many places to go, you know. You know, just and, and Moses, they're crying to Moses, what are you supposed to do here? They come in here, we got the Red Sea. Tell them to go forward. How are they supposed to go forward? I mean, this don't look good. He said, don't worry, you know, you don't, it's me. That was a situation that totally depended on God. Yeah. There was no other way. Right. And all of a sudden, can you imagine this thing? And all of a sudden, the right. Red Sea opened. Right. Now, not only the thing about it, that it opened up, and all of them went across yeah. on dry land. So it dried up, yeah. you know? And, and it dried up, and all of them got across. Not one was left behind. Right. 
You know, all the horses, everything, every cattle, the kids, everybody got a crop. Yeah. And then, and then, when the Egyptians start coming, God closed. He said, "You'll see them no more." And on the other side of the sea, boy, they're dancing everything. They should have never ever forgot that right. that God delivered them. Right. They saw it right in front of them. Right. Don't ever forget what God has done for you. Amen. Keep remembering that every day. Okay? Because when those hard times come, and they'll come, we go through things. That's just the reality of life. We go through things. But that same God yes. that was with us at the beginning is going to be the same God at the end. Because he said he's the beginning and the ending, yes. the Alpha and Omega. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. That's right. I thank God that he keeps them. Yes. Hallelujah. And that they are healed. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. That's all. Awesome. That's right. That's and right. And God uses them, yes. and I don't think we should ever be afraid to go to the doctor. When man exhausted his all he's done, right. then we have to turn to Almighty God with all of our heart. But you know, I, I don't think there's a problem with going to the doctor on some things. Right. Yeah. Now, cancer, they tell you there's nothing we can do. Well, yes, there is. That's right. Of course there's something we can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's nothing man can do. That's right. And so I, 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 haven't, I haven't checked with him. I don't know if Toby has or not about what he found out. But I want to pray for him because he, I'm telling you, he's a live wire. I keep trying to get him here, but I don't know. He, he wears himself out pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> he preaches to everybody. I mean, that he's nonstop. Yeah. I'll bet they're thinking, 
certainly we have. We can't do anything without God. Then why would we be foolish to just turn our back on the technology that God's given us and man's abilities to, to, to help us? That doesn't mean we're not trusting God. We still believe that God can do it. However, he, he does it through the doctor or he does it supernaturally. The Bible talks about, uh, you know, you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So there's a recovery. So a lot of times there's a recovery process. It doesn't just... It isn't instantaneous. It's just as miraculous. Right. It's just God sets it in motion and then it takes its place. So, I mean, I, I'd hate to think anybody, unless they've got a very clear and obvious sign from God that he's going to do it and they don't need to see a doctor. I, I, I just think it's it's just God has given us this. He's given us the mind of Christ. And for you to turn your back on the, the, the possibility of, of dealing through this medicine is just, it's just stupid. I mean, let's face it, it's ridiculous. So, you know, yes, we're going to believe God even when I go to the doctor, because a lot of times I don't have a lot of faith in the doctor, but, but he's got some tools that he can use. Yeah. That's right. So I'm putting my confidence in God and believing that he'll help that doctor to practice his medicine, right, right. to perfect that medicine that right. Jesus has already right. Right. That's it. You yeah. know, the woman with the issue of blood, she yeah. has spent everything she yeah. has on yeah. doctors. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, she reaches a point mm. where she realizes they cannot do it. Right. That's but right. I'm her to this man. Right. That's right. If I can touch the hand yeah, of the right. yeah. that's right. I believe I'll be healed. That's right. right. And that's what we have to do. She yeah. had exhausted everything. Yeah. Now, we shouldn't have to do that. We trust him right up front. Yeah. But if we have gone through those things, we still, no matter what the doctor says, that's not the end result. That's, that's right. right. The last word. Amen. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, about two weeks ago, I asked my nephew and I don't know if it's here to share it. Um, six months of pain. Um, right now, as I sit here, I have no pain. Woo! Hallelujah. Yes. This is day three. The nurses, the at home nurses that used to come right three times a week and we're down to two we're down to one this time from Saturday um, so they're no longer coming um, the doctor instead of seeing me twice a week turn around to see me once a week um, <clears throat> doctor gave me a note to return to work I went to do my training for driving the school bus and I'm going back tomorrow and um, you know as your sister was saying
Yeah. what it's about well one more time okay would you all stand and go to prayer thank you Jesus oh father God you are so worthy of praise Lord we thank you for the testimonies this morning we thank you for your goodness we thank you that how that you have healed you are the one that heals you are the one that delivers. You are the one that can make a way out of no way. Oh, Father God, we, we, we thank you for Cindy's life, Lord. We thank you for how you're healing her. Lord, we thank you for how you're healing Sheila. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for Myron to be able to have that testimony go back to work. Hallelujah. Lord, we ask you to continue to be with Lavola and the boys in the whole situation, that they will come out. She will come out. Praising God. Oh, that's what it's all about. Oh, Father God, that you would be with Doak in the situation with his legs, Lord. Father God, that you would be with that. The situation, oh, Lord, when we, we think about uh, uh, Sally's kids and the, and, the, and the situation with the child, Lord, only you could have done that. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for that young child praying and believing. Hallelujah. That was a baby there. Father God, in the name of Jesus that you would come here and meet us because it's all about you. Hallelujah. Where there's two or three touching and agreeing, you are in the midst. And you are in the midst of this service today because, Lord, we want to meet you here. Hallelujah. Because you're always met us at the mercy seat. Hallelujah. That the throne of God, that we can go boldly to the throne of God because that's what it's all about. That, Lord, you hear our concerns. They're going above the roof all the way to your throne. Father God, that lives will be changed today. Lord, we thank you for Maritas and the kids, that Lord, that situation could have been a lot worse with flu and everything going around. But hallelujah, you are more. Your name is above every name. You are above flu. You are above diabetes. You are above heartache. You are above all those things. Because one thing we know, God, you are still God no matter what. And it's all about in the beginning, God. You said in your word, you love us with an everlasting love. Oh, Father God. And you're there, hallelujah, to give us a future and a hope. And our hope is in you. Lord, we're going to praise you today. We're going to bless you today. We're going to lift you up today. The Bible said if you be lifted up, you draw all men up to you. And we're going to lift you up today. We're going to praise you today, Father God. So that that glory will come down as the praise goes up. Oh, hallelujah. We want to thank you today. We want to give you the praise. We want to never forget, never forget what you have done for us. Oh, hallelujah. That we surrender all. Every area of our life belongs to you. Oh, Father God, we thank you this morning. We praise you this morning. You are God above God. Hallelujah. You can do the impossible. The Bible says, for with God, all things are possible. It doesn't say something. It doesn't say a few things. It doesn't say many things. It's so for with God, 
all things are possible. And the word says, hallelujah, hallelujah. And the word says, is there anything, is there anything too hard for God? The answer is nothing. Oh, hallelujah. And today, Lord, we want to praise you. We want to thank you in your wonderful holy name. We pray amen and amen. Hallelujah. You have a cell phone please turn off or put it on vibrate please thank you very much <coughs> okay how's that entryway update yeah, yeah this is what looks like uh, <coughs> walking in the door right now um it's as uh, foundational as it can get um we're looking for the updated uh, uh first of all repaint plus uh Okay, uh, February 10th, is this, this Friday? This Friday. Right, Eastern Gate House of Prayer at 7 p.m. if you can find it. And I'll let Mike. Ezekiel 22.30, Pastor uh, brought it forth a couple weeks ago, and, and uh, I asked the Lord to bear with me for my glasses, but I expect the Lord to give me some focus here. Um, and I sought for a man among them that should make the haven standing yet before me for the land that I should not destroy it but I found none <coughs> he found some here mm -hmm. we're going to stand in the gap we're going to release the kingdom not only in here but take it out beyond these four walls and as it was spoken to either last week or the week before the Jerusalem's blown off this place and it's going to just boil out all over this region so time to stand in the gap church hallelujah, hallelujah. and let's speak the word of the Lord together. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs you follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the power for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would Brother Toby and Jason come up and take the offering for us, please? I don't know about anybody else, but don't you just love the sound of it when they sing them together? Yeah. <laughs> Brother Jason, would you be so kind to pray over the offering for us, please? Lord, we thank you for today, Lord, and yeah. I pray that you bless this offering, Lord, and just that you bless the gift that we're giving here, Lord, just in every way, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Father, we're just so thankful for what you've already done in this service. Thank you, Lord, for ministering to us as we tried to minister to you. Lord, your word says that when we lift our voices in song to you, we speak to one another. That fulfills the circle. Lord, you never leave anything unfinished. And we thank you, Lord, that everything you've ever done is finished in our lives. And as we praise you for it, we speak that truth to one another. It is finished. It is done. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Let's celebrate the victory right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless all of you. You may be seated. Thank you, Tim, for opening and sharing, setting the tone. Amen. For the Holy Spirit to move. And thank the worship team, all of you, for coming up and being a part of this helping us to, to magnify the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. While the work team is finding their seats, I'd just uh, dismiss the Sunday school kids. You can go downstairs to the Sunday school classes, those of you that are going. Praise God. Thank you, Mike. Hallelujah, Jesus. going to let everybody kind of get settled and catch our breath here for a moment. Praise God. We used to talk about quenching the spirit. I used to get so freaked out when I'd have to go preach because if there was a real move, I'd think, oh my God. That's about as egotistical as you can get. If you think you're going to stop the Holy Spirit from doing something, praise God. It took me a few years to figure that out, but Praise God. How many of you are getting sick of cloudy weather? Yeah. We've had some sunshine the last couple of days. That's great. But, you know, I was telling Sally, I seriously love clouds. Sunshine Friday. Okay, I'm not random. You guys are just not thinking as quick here. Come on. Serious. <laughs> Serious clouds. I'm trying to quench it, but, you know, you're not helping, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. My neighbor came over yesterday and was telling me about the, I actually had a, uh, a funeral uh, graveside service I had to do uh, Friday uh, for a, a guy's mom that uh, I knew his mom, not real well, but I knew his mom. I'd known him since he was in school. He went to school with my, with my oldest kids. And uh, so that was a, that was a blessing in a lot of ways, and uh, when I got home, I was talking to my neighbor, and he was telling me that he'd bought a new hearing aid, and he was telling me all about it. He said, I just I got this, it's a state-of-the-art hearing aid, and he said it cost me $4,000, $4,000. I mean, I just have you yell, you know, talk louder or something, you know, but he said, yeah, $4,000 is state-of-the-art, and so I said, what kind is it? And he said, about 1230 <laughs> Praise the Lord. I think I'll just trust the Lord for my hearing. Praise God. Amen. So I want to get into the Word of God here. And before I do uh, go to the actual scripture for this morning, I just want to, we were talking about some things Wednesday night. And, uh, you know, last week I, I was, uh, last Sunday I was preaching on the faith of Abraham. And uh, I want to kind of keep it in context because I think sometimes we look at these patriarchs and the, and the uh, great uh, men and women of the Bible, and we have this tendency to elevate them to such a degree that uh, they seem untouchable and that, you know, we're so screwed up that we're never going to be able to accomplish the things that they've done. So, yes, uh, you know, it's about faith, but it, every one of us knows that God has a purpose for our lives, for each of us, amen? But it's easy to make the mistake of getting your eyes on the purpose instead of the one who purposed. Amen. And... Uh, Moses, you know, the scripture talks about he, he knew 
that he was special, that he had been called to deliver the people of Israel. His mother told him all about, you know, the, the kids being uh, killed and, and how he was protected by the Pharaoh's daughter and raised up in the court and so forth. And so he, he understood he had a purpose. But the problem was he got his eyes off the one who purposed, and he goes out and he kills this Egyptian thinking he's just doing, you know, what, what he should do, right? And it screwed everything up. And now the Pharaoh's after him, and, you know, he splits and goes out into the desert for, for 40 years. But then I want to show you how these things can become repetitious to where they, they can come back to haunt us, you know what I'm saying? Now, we've got the grace of God, it's, and the truth is so did Moses. But let me show you something in Numbers chapter 20. If you can go there, Mike, I'd like to read from Numbers chapter 20, verses 8 through 12. And again, this isn't actually my text, but it kind of helps to contextualize maybe what I do want to talk to you about this morning. So he says, take the rod. Now, this is the Lord telling the, 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 the people of Israel, this is the second time this has happened. And again, now, as Tim was talking about, how it's quick we forget the miracles, you know. I mean, he'd taken them through the Red Sea. He'd delivered them. He gave them manna. He'd given them water from the rock before. Now they're complaining again because they don't have any water. So God says, take the rod, gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of, the, out of this rock. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given thee. So, you know, I've, been, I've heard this preached from that scripture many times about how that that's how come, you know, Moses, it was a type of Moses beating Jesus, the rock. That's not the case. I, I don't believe that's actually true because what... What Jesus was smitten twice. I mean, he was beaten, he was wounded for our transgressions, and by his stripes were healed. Then he was crucified. So there was two, two acts that took place in, the, in the, the leading up to and the crucifixion of Christ. So I don't believe that's the case. What it was is that, if you can go back to verse 11, I think it is. Verse 10, Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we talking about him and Aaron, yeah. must we fetch water out of this rock? Yeah. That's where he made his mistake. Yeah. The people were inclined to believe it was Aaron and Moses that were accomplishing this, and that's why God said, you didn't sanctify me. You made this about you, and because of that, you didn't honor me before the people. You didn't glorify me before the people. Whether it was intentional or not, you made it about you, right. and because of that, you don't get to enter into my rest. Right. You don't get to go into the promised land. Right. Now, because of God's grace, we know that Moses did eventually because on the Mount of Transfiguration, which is on the other side of Jordan, he was there. Jesus saw him and the disciples that were with him saw him. And uh, so he did get that. God did give him grace to see that. But the reason, you, the reason we don't enter in to the rest of God, to the finished work of God, is because we're still struggling too hard to do things ourselves that God has said he's already done. We look at ourselves and we either do them because we feel like, well, I prayed enough this month or I fasted and I've done this and I've done that and everything is going good so I can accomplish something for God now. No. Or the obverse of that is we have a bad week and we screw up everything and we get upset and we, you know, let a few words come that we didn't really want out and then we, you know, do things and act ways that we just regret and now we feel like now God can't do anything with me because I'm such a mess. Forgetting that whether I'm good or whether I'm bad, it's still God that does it. It's still God that has to do it, and my confidence has to be in Him, as it's been said already over this morning, not in me. Because I'll, I'll, if it's about me, I'll, I'm, I'm up and down, and I'm like most people, I have good days and bad days and good hours and bad hours, and I never know for sure how I'm going to react. Now, I want to do the right thing, but sometimes I let me get in the way of what God is really wanting to do. Amen? So that's, that's the idea. He didn't honor God. He didn't make it about God. So he couldn't enter into that rest. God's finished work, which is God's purpose for each and every one of us. You can't enter into it by your own strength. 
but you have to do it by the faith in God's grace. Amen? So that's kind of the context from which I want to start this morning. So if we can, let's go to Genesis uh, now, Mike, Genesis chapter 2, and we'll read beginning at verse 7 through 9 at least, and then we'll jump around a little bit. Now these are all familiar scriptures, and, and we've dealt with this here recently, but I, I just I want to get, again go back and look at the, the beginning of everything as far as humanity is concerned. I mean, historically speaking, not not the beginning, because obviously it goes back before there was any of us, but we were already there. But we look at things, as I was saying Wednesday night, in linear time. I mean, we, everything is, you know, we have timelines for everything. So that's how humans look at stuff, but that's not the way God looks at it. So the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to sight and good for food. The tree of life also was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you can drop down to verse 20 now, Mike, and we'll read verses 20 through 22. Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found any help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Praise the Lord. All right, Genesis chapter 3 now, verses 14 and 15. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, now we're after the fact, God tempted them, they responded, and now God is dealing with the tempter. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, meaning the seed of Eve, and thou shalt bruise his heel, or enemy then would do some damage but we will prevail Amen. now I, I want to I guess look at this in a way that I don't know that I've ever seen it necessarily but what I've seen through the scripture is God does everything through a woman's womb now don't get nervous here because I'm going to get a lot worse than this before I'm done but I'm just saying we don't we don't realize everything is about being birthed. Everything is about being new. Everything is about, and it's, but it's all part of a plan that is ancient, beyond ancient, it's beyond any way of measuring time. So God says that I, through, the, through a woman, I'm going to do this. And through many women, eventually I'll do this. I could have saved this for Mother's Day, but it's going to get kind of ugly before I'm done, praise the Lord. So... <laughs> But Genesis 2 celebrates a, a loving God, a loving Father who adores his creation. They're his masterpiece. They're the, the, the epitome of everything that he wants to do. They're the apex of his creation. And he smiles when they enjoy the garden. The Bible talks about him walking with them in the garden. I mean, it was an enjoyment. It's just like if you have kids or grandkids, how you just love to watch them play, have them, ha having a good time innocent without any worries or fears and you know all the junk that's going on in the world and they're totally oblivious to it and you think isn't that great you know wouldn't it be wonderful to feel that way and be that way and and think that way so then you come to Genesis chapter 3 and God's relationship with creation is forever destroyed or at least it should be God isn't some impatient father fuming with annoyance at his naughty kids. God commands Adam and Eve to enjoy creation, to tend it, to keep it, to experience it, to participate in the abundance of it. He wants them to find pleasure in his garden, in the earth realm. He wants them to impact this earth realm and carry on the divine mission, which is to rule over it, to develop it, to cause it to grow, to multiply. But the image bearers 
rebel against the Creator. Instead of destroying them, God forgives them. God will stop at nothing to fix their mess and relate with them. We're talking about breaking chains this morning. Well, that's exactly what God does. He's the one that does it. Amen? That's what he's been doing from the first human being on this planet. God promises to redeem the world, bring us back to perfect harmony with him, back to where there is no schism, where there's no division, where there's no, you know, uncomfortableness between us and him. So Genesis 3.15 says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It'll bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise its heel. Now, let me just tell you something. Everything, and I mean everything, hinges on that promise. Praise the Lord. Yes. Look at Romans chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now back to Genesis, Mike, and chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now here's what's as critical as anything about this, this little bit of monologue here, is that before Abraham does anything good, God promises to give him the land of Canaan, to make of him this mighty nation, to make him a blessing. Yeah. It's an unconditional promise, and that promise forms the backbone for the entire Bible. It's our authority on earth. It's our right to be heirs yes. and joint heirs with Jesus yes. Christ. Yes. So our salvation, our sozo, in other words, everything's back to where it's supposed to be, where we have the authority, we have the power, we have, we have it all. It's not just going to heaven, but it's, it's bringing heaven here. It's manifesting heaven here on earth. So our, our sozo rests on God's unchanging commitment to a pagan idolater. That's what Abraham was, or Abram was, when God made the promise. He had probably been kneeling before the... Uh, the goddesses in their temples, they had multiple gods. There, was, there were all kinds of, they had uh, temple prostitutes. When God spoke to him, I don't know what he was doing, but he could have been in the temple doing the most despicable stuff that we would think of as being really sinful today. Right. And yet it didn't bother God to go there and talk to him and bring him from there. Right. It wasn't like he got it all together and then he went to Canaan he was that person that's the person he was when God called him so everything that we have every promise from God hinges on this promise that God made to this pagan idolater we talked last week about Abraham's faith and, and he did some good things but Abraham's life is also littered with doubt it's, 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 there's all kinds of fear and unfaithfulness and lying he was a habitual liar You ever get discouraged about your go ongoing struggles with imperfection, with failure, with you think you got it all together and then it's just like a slap in the face and you show up again? Praise the Lord. It's no wonder that Paul, when he was looking for an example of Old Testament grace, went straight to Abraham. Romans chapter 4, verse 5 again. When I did this young man's, well, he's not a young man, he's 50 years old now, but when I did his mother's funeral, I had a lot of things going through my mind leading up to it, preparing for it, and then actually doing it. And a lot of it was memories of 40 years ago or 45 or 35 years ago, whatever. 
was 38 years ago when he was a kid at school with my kids, where my life was. And it was difficult. I mean, I had, you know how the enemy would just flood you with bad thoughts, you know, bad memories, bad you. So I was dealing with all of that while I was dealing with their grief and the loss of a loved one. But I knew he was dealing with the same thing. And I wanted to give him some kind of hope, the same kind of hope that God gave me 40 years ago or more. Well, what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Verse 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. All that means is our, our, our faith isn't us. Our faith is just believing him, right. believing what he's done, believing that it really does change everything, that it really alters all of history Amen. and future. Genesis again, Mike, 15. I want to read verses 6 through 12 this time. He believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I'm the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? So apparently the word just wasn't enough. I mean, he was still questioning. And he said unto him, take me a heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. Now, this is just a, and most of you know this anyway, but just for the sake of maybe those of you who don't, this was the way you made agreements in that day. And what it signified was you, you kill these animals, and then the two of you that were making this agreement or this covenant would then walk together down through this, these split up animals, the blood and the whole mess, and it would signify that you were in a gr an agreement that would either of you would break it, it would cost you your life. You'd forfeit your own life for breaking the agreement. Okay? They, Abram knew this. This was, a tr this was traditional. It was what people did all the time back in those days. Right. Amen? So he knew what, exactly what was going on. So if you will now, Mike, drop down to verse 17. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. So this is the covenant. The covenant that we still enjoy and embrace and are recipients of, the benefits of. God, whose presence here is depicted as the smoke and the fire passing between the animals. Abraham doesn't pass through the animals, which was customary, which was the way you were supposed to do it, and he didn't because he was asleep. So the ceremony is not a transaction. It's not two-sided. So I can tell you, God doesn't help those who help themselves. God's commitment to Abraham, and therefore God's commitment to us, to be our Savior, to be our Lord, to be our Father, to be our friend, is unilateral. In other words, it's one-sided. It is a gift. It is grace in its purest sense. See, grace is just as necessary for our ongoing life as it is for our conversion, for us to have healing, to experience that, to re release it, deliverance, power. It all is about his grace because this is a one-sided transaction. And I'm going to, I want to read something to you, if you will, Mike, go to Genesis chapter 38, and I'm going to read this whole chapter. 
It's not normal that I do this, but I, I want to this morning. If you ever want, if, you, if you've got a problem with pornography, go to chapter 38 of Genesis. I don't know how many it's in it. I think, uh, I, don't, I don't know, 30? But this is one of the filthiest sections of the Bible. And God gave it to us with all of its grit and all of its gunk and all of its mess. But there's a reason for me wanting to read it to you this morning, and I'll explain it to you. It came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adulamite whose name was Hirath. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he took her and went in unto her. And she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bare a son, and she called his name Onan. And she yet again conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah. And he was a Chezib. He was at Chezib when she bare him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. Which is tradition. That's what they did. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. In other words, if we have a kid, it's not going to be my kid. And it came to pass, when he went in unto his brother's wife, that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. I'm, I'm hoping you're all grasping what's going on here. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, my son, be grown. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. So she leaves. And in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up unto his sheep shearers to Timnath, he and his friend Hira. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. She put her widow's garments off from her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Shelah was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot because she had covered her face. And he turned in unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? You're getting the King James here. This is a prostitute and a guy trying to make a deal. And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? Or give me something down. And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet, or thy ring, and thy bracelets, thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it to her, and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. And she arose and went away, and laid by her veil, and laid by her veil from her, and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand. But he found her not. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the way? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said that there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, Let her take it to her, lest we be ashamed or shamed. Hold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. And it came to pass about three months after that, it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot, and also, behold, she's with child by the whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth, and let her be burnt. This reminds me of the woman caught in the act of adultery brought before Jesus. And, you know, you never hear about who was she with. They were caught, she was caught in the act in bed, so there had to have been a guy there. And Jesus said, Where are your accusers? I don't accuse you either. But look at this guy. He's, he's the one. I mean, he made a habit of prostitution and being with prostitutes. And then he finds out his daughter-in-law is accused of being a prostitute and pregnant. He wants her to be burnt. Right? He, he, he wants some action, praise the Lord. So when she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these? 
the signet and the bracelets and the staff. And Judah acknowledged them and said, she had been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son, and he knew her again no more. And it came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass that when she travailed, that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. And it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. And she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Perez. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zerah. So, one of the most unsettling stories of grace in the Bible. And it is about grace, I promise you. Judah not only had sex with his daughter-in-law, he impregnated her. She has twins, Perez and Zira. And you thought you had a bad week. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But God takes this ugly story and he turns it into a grace story. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verses 23 through 31. 1 Corinthians 1, 23 through 31. We preach Jesus crucified under the Jews, a stumbling block, under the Greeks, foolishness. But under them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now I want you to notice something uh, really deep here. Genesis 38 occurs right after Genesis 37 and just before Genesis 39. Brilliant, right? I was up all night dealing with that, praise the Lord. But it's, sig it's significant, though, because Genesis 37 begins the story of Joseph, the Joseph story. And that whole chapter, and actually it runs all the way through to chapter 50 of Genesis. It's all about Joseph. But chapter 37 is the beginning of the Joseph story that goes all the way to the end of Genesis. Joseph is known for his unwavering obedience. He's one of the most moral characters in the entire Bible. But Joseph isn't mentioned at all in Genesis 38. Although he's the star of Genesis 37. He's completely left out of Genesis 38. But then... He pops up again as the main character in Genesis 39 all the way through Genesis 50. It's all we're talking about is Joseph. So the story of Judah and Tamar interrupts the story of Joseph. And Judah and Tamar, their intrusion into Joseph's story is intentional. And here's why. Judah's debacle is inserted into Joseph's story in order to contrast the two characters. The difference couldn't be any greater. Joseph flees sexual lust. Judah runs to it. Joseph is morally impeccable. Judah is a moral train wreck. Why the contrast? Look at, again, if you will, Mike, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. 2 Corinthians 1, 20 through 22. For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now he which establish us 
establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. So if you read the Bible morally, you might conclude that the contrast here between Judah and Joseph is to show us how to live moral lives like Joseph and how to not live immorally like Judah. Now, there's obvious truth there, but that's not the main point of the contrast. Ephesians 3, verses 6 through 12. that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, known by us, not, not us knowing it, but that the principalities would know it by us as a result of us, Amen. might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. So the contrast is messianic. It shows us that God's promise to redeem us and to be in relationship with us, to love and to forgive us and to enjoy us cannot be undone by horrible behavior. God will bring us back to him and he will do it by his grace. The Messiah, Jesus, God in the flesh, will kill the snake and redeem the world. And he will come through Judah. Jesus will release his power through us. Even though everything in our transactional bones wants to see God use Joseph, the morally superior choice, God deliberately selects the genealogical line of Judah and not Joseph to bring forth the Savior for God himself to come in the flesh. Everything in our religious minds tells us that surely it would be Joseph. But God himself chooses this morally despicable person. He says that through his genes, through his genealogy, I'll come. He's sending a pretty loud, clear message to each and every one of us, to this whole world, to this whole planet. The snake-crushing seed of Eve, according to Jesus' genealogy, will be this Judah. Matthew chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Last scripture here. Matthew 1, verses 2 and 3. This is why why I love the Lord. Because he really did first for me. And he shows it over and over and over. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat Judah and his brethren. And Judah begat Perez and Zerah of Thamar. Thamar. And Perez begot Esram, and Esram begot Aram. So God handpicks Perez, this illegitimate son, from an illicit affair between a father-in-law and a daughter-in-law, dressed as a harlot, to be part of his plan to redeem the world. God's in the business of working through our messes. No failure, no mess and prevent God from using you. Frail, flawed, and forever loved. Grace means that God seeks out repugnant sinners 
the Judas and uses them to redeem wicked people. Yes. And we are Judah. Yes. And we ought to thank God for it. Yes. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. So whatever the devil tries to tell you, you can't do anything for God. You're, you're too messed up. You come from too, too, too wicked, too messed up background. You're not doing it all right. Now you've got it screwed up. You're still screwing it up. Just how about whisper the name Judah? And then Jesus. God himself chose. Think about it. He chose to dwell in us. He loved us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for you and I. If you have any, any qualms about how God wants to use you, get rid of them. Forget about it. And just step out in faith, his faith, and what he has done. If God will do this for us, he'll do the same thing for the sinner that you're praying for, for the unbeliever that you have to work with, for your con convoluted, messed up, upside down world. He will still move, and he'll still do it through us broken people flawed and screwed up but forever loved by him he's proud of us the glory is all God's you think this doesn't just make the devil insane he can't have it no matter how evil he tries to tell you you were or you are or somebody else is he's on the outside looking in we are already in Christ, one with God. Yes. He has declared us righteous, holy, <laughs> sanctified, yes. set apart for his purpose. Yes. Not our purpose. It's his purpose. Yes. Just keep your eye on him, and the purpose will accomplish itself. It will do what God intended it to do. Give the Lord one more hand this morning. Yes. Praise yes. God. Yes. Amen. Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate you being here today. Go out in the power of his might yes. and just see what God can do in your life. Yes. God bless you. You're all dismissed in Jesus' name. Yes.